All right, we live. Mic check. Okay. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Oh great. Mic check one two. Hello, is anybody on?
no idea. Hello? 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 Hey, how are you? Hello. Hey, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm doing just fine. I'm fine, how are you? Doing just fine. We're going to get started in about another minute. Alright everybody, peace to everybody that's here in Jesus' name. We're going to go ahead and open up and start for uh, Bible Wednesday night live question and answer Bible study. So we're going to go ahead and open up with prayer. We ask that your sisters have your heads covered. Brothers, uncover your heads. You was made in the image of God. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Man. All right, good peoples, for those that don't know, not that it's that important, I'm Brother Jediah. I'll be conducting our Bible study for the day. I'm generally up here with a reader, but we're a little short today, so I'm going to try to hold down both sides of it, which shouldn't be a difficult task. We are now opening up for our questions. Do we have any questions or comments for Bible study this evening? Any comments or questions? All right. Well, I did have one question to come in, and I'll pull it up and go ahead and answer that one while we wait on our uh, YouTube and phone line to present whatever questions may come our way. Just give me one quick second here. I just got to uh, get this thing to move a little quicker. Uh, here's our first question. Well, technology is sweet, but it sure is slow when you need it to be fast. One second. Let's see if I can just pull it up here. see and here's our here's our question uh, does Acts chapter 2 17 through 21 have anything to do with the eclipse that happened at this that I just passed actually um, is it or could this be the sign before he sends his judgment? So the question is coming based off of Acts chapter 2. And I thought that was a good question too. Acts chapter 2. And, <clears throat> and the, the, it, it, the, the, the question comes from Acts chapter 2 verse 17 through 20 and I'll read it and it should come to pass in the last days saith the Lord that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show Wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire vapor of smoke the, sh the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord and It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved So that's a pretty fair question um And let's retract the events that happened in Acts chapter 2 so and, and, and we're going to read more, of course, but in this particular chapter, this is what people, this is the day of Pentecost. And on this particular day, uh, which was shortly after Jesus had left, uh, the, the disciples were meet, gathered together and they began to preach, you know, and this is where people speak in tongue. But this is where that comes from, like probably the first real like mention of somebody else speaking in tongue in the Bible. Um, when Peter began to speak, because it was a multitude of people that were from different nat nations or nationalities that was there, or nations, we should say, when Peter began to talk, everybody began to hear them. But a lot of times what we fail to do is look at what Peter actually was saying. So I'm going to pick it up a little higher. 
from verse four, I mean 14, and then we're going to continue. So I'm at Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. It said, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to, the, to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So the reason he's making that statement is because you just heard chaos from the outside looking in. So it was the Pentecost. They thought, hey, maybe these men were drunk. He was like, nah, we're not drunk. Then he says, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. So the reality is what Peter is doing is actually teaching them from out of the book of Joel. So for us to grab a better understanding of this particular passage, we want to go back to Joel. In addition, he made in verse 17, he said, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, that is such a relative statement, the last days. Or you have to kind of be clear on what time you're talking about. And here's what I mean by that, I'm going to take us to another scripture and then we're going to go from here to Joel and actually see where he read this. But uh, matter of fact, I don't even need to do it like that. I mean, I do. I'm, I'm going to do it like that. But let's let's go to Hebrews chapter one. Hebrews chapter one. And we're going to pick it up at verse one and two. Hebrews chapter one, which is to, to your right, if you got a Bible. If you got paper Bibles, some of us use computer Bibles now. And I'm going to start at chapter 1 and verse 1. So it reads, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, have in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So in this particular passage, and I'm not saying that this is exactly what Acts is saying. We're going to get there. What I'm using this to show is that, hey, when you start talking last days, you need to be clear exactly what you're saying. Because here, this is the last days. Now, we know today today is the last days as well. We can, we can make that statement. Or we can even back up and, uh, <clears throat> and pick it up. I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I mean, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it's just a second witness to looking at what the last days are. That's the first thing we're going to try to clear up there before we get back. And the heart of the question is the equinox, I mean the equinox, the eclipse that took place. Is that some type of sign that has anything to do with the coming of the Lord? And the answer to that is no. It's just, um, it's no different than a sunny day to a cloudy day. That's what the eclipse was. Um, you know, some people... Well, let's read this first. Second Timothy chapter two, I mean, chapter three, and we're going to pick it up in verse one and two. It says this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come for men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontentant, fierce despises of those that are good, Tra traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, um, he, again, we see in the last days, and, he, and he's saying, well, this should happen, but this has been happening. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than look like this. So, again, when you look in the Bible and it says, well, the last days, you want to look into it a little deeper to get, make sure you're getting some good, or make sure you're not misleading yourself to just think automatically that, hey, we must be talking about, uh, let's just say, the last three and a half years of prophecy or something. Like, not necessarily. We, You want to make sure you read more of it. And when you read that um, Acts, I mean, it, it says some more things, like it said that the sun was going to be darkened, the moon was going to give her light. I mean, yeah, the sun was going to be darkened, the moon was going to be red. So it says some other things. 
So we'll look at it, and we we'll, like I said, hopefully we can try to clear it up a little bit. And again, we are looking at Acts chapter two, and what we're gonna do now is go to well, we're looking at Acts chapter two, but we're gonna go to Joel chapter two. But again, it's Acts chapter two. It says, and it shall come to pass in the last day, say of God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and that is important. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaids will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 19, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and, in, and, and the moon unto blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. So notice in that particular passage, and it continues, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So notice in that particular passage, verse 20, it said, and the sun shall be darkened, be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. So that's just letting you see, you got end days, but then you got this day of the Lord. And we'll look at that a little bit too. So let's go to uh, Joel chapter 2. See where he got this from. And 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 honestly, he was talking about the end times. And we'll start at verse 1 just so we can get an idea of the time frame. Uh, Joel chapter 2 and 1. So it reads, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. But all the inhabitants of the land, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is nigh at hand. So now we got end days and day of the Lord. Now notice here it starts talking about the day of the Lord is coming. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong, they have not been ever the light. Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire, a fire devoured before them and behind them. Okay, we're going to jump down. So, uh, as he continues, verse 15, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So, this, this chapter, and that was referring to the Lord coming back, is talking about the coming of the Lord. And if you read more, verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. So after he come back, he starts telling you some of the things that he's going to do upon his return. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, caterpillar, and the palm palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you should eat in plenty and be satisfied in the praise of and praise the name of the Lord, your God, that have dealt wondrously with you. And my people should never be ashamed. And you should know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord, your God, and none else. And my people should never be ashamed. So, like, he's he's telling you this is what's going to happen. When he comes back, it's going to be set up where things are going to be new again. After and, 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 and in this particular chapter, he was first discussing coming back, making his return. So now we have verse 28, and it should come to pass afterward. So it, like that would almost sound like this stuff going to all happen afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heaven and in earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it should come to pass. So he had already told them about the great and terrible day. So he's saying this is going to happen before the great and terrible day. And we're going to see that this is going to happen. And it should come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So notice, he didn't read all of that part. He didn't finish that part. He just stopped that, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, right? Now, reanalyzing the verse that we read, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit unto all flesh. Now, we're going to find this somewhere else. So here's what it is. We're going to go back to Acts. We're going to make it simple. Uh, when you start talking last days, 
they had begun. Like, and we're, we're going to prove that. But they had begun in that day. The events that he's saying begun in that day. They just don't finish until the end. So, you know, that's the first thing we want to, meaning, let's, let's, let's get some more proof of this. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44. I think. Isaiah chapter 44. And I'm going to start reading at verse 1. And he said, um, hold on, let me look for, before I read this, let me get to another verse real quick. And it won't take me but a minute to find it. Um, let's go to, um... Okay, is it here more than I thought? That's okay. It's gonna take but a minute. Uh, let's go to Amos chapter eleven. We're gonna go there, and then we're gonna come back to Isaiah forty-four. So we're looking at that Acts chapter two, and really at the end of the day, the questions that we're asking is number one: What is Acts chapter two talking about? But number two: Did the events of the eclipse have anything to do with that? Um, it's not the first eclipse either. I think I don't know exactly when. The last time we had one, but um, it's not the same eclipse. And something else you want to pe take note of is it didn't occur everywhere. Like, it's not like this happened to everybody in sight, meaning everybody didn't see or everybody didn't get to bear witness to the sun and the, and the, pa oh, no, the moon being in the passageway of the sun. That's when an eclipse is. But I'm at Amos chapter uh, 8. And I said we're going to start at 11, but we're going to start a little higher. Let's start at verse 7. Amos 8 and 7. The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob. Surely I would never forget any of their works. Should not the land tremble for this and everyone mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up holy as a flood and it should be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Verse 9. And it should come to pass in that day, said the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon and I will darken the earth in a clear day. Now, there is a time when the sun went down at noon and that would be at the death of Jesus. Then verse 10, he says, and I will turn your feast into mourning. So at the death of Jesus, that's what happened. He died as the Passover and then that whole feast was mourning. Um, Should have been. And all your songs and lamentations, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it a mourning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they that wander, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And that day, well, that's good. So, when 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 Jesus died, that began what we know as a famine. Paul kind of speaks up. Paul sort of speaks of it as well. As well. So I'm gonna turn there real quick. Let us read that as our second witness to it. So let's go to um. Uh, um, second, second Timothy chapter four. This Paul talking in his day. Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four. I'm gonna start at verse one. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So look, in uh, Joel, no, in Amos we read that it was going to be a famine of the word of God. People was going to be looking for the word of God 
and not be able to find it. Paul even says, hey, it's going to be a time when they're not going to endure sound doctrine. Okay? So now you got the word of God basically leaving. Um, historians, I like, I like how historians place it. Historians tell us uh, during the dark ages, and they tell us what happened, but the reality is what happened during the dark ages is the the word of God, the true word of God was trampled and 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 uh replaced by really the doctrine of devils and men so this all really happened in the dark ages this is during your time of your martin luther's and all that kind that's like considered the dark age so that's why i and in that time period is israel the priest of god oh man we in captivity and we approaching american captivity at this point like we coming out of the dark ages that's where we ended up into american captivity where we begin to get english and then we begin to get the bible that we read today you know by coming out of, you know coming from that time period because really and in, in in the time after after so we got going back to amos and where it said there was going to be a famine in the land and it referred to the time when Jesus died. Say it was going to be morning on that uh, feast day or high day or holy day or whatever, right? Well, shortly thereafter, the next 50 to 60 years, we are into Israel begins to go into captivity. And the job that Israel as a priest or a church to God is supposed to do is picked up by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, picked up by but not done properly. They change the rules to fit their doctrine, which is, I guess, understandable. I mean, they had pagan days. They had to deal with Easter, Christmas, uh, New Year's, things of that nature. So they incorporated those things, Sunday worship. They incorporated those things into, into what the church was presenting. So what ends up happening is now there's a famine for the true word of God because the people that's supposed to give the word of God are in captivity. The imposters have come in and now decided that they have a new word of God, their God. And so we in this famine. Now, going back to Isaiah or going to Isaiah 44. And it reads. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou just run whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass as willows by the water course. So the Lord, and we're going to read this again and another way to really understand it more but what we're getting at is hey the lord is saying i'm gonna pour my spirit upon my uh 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 pour my spirit upon your seed talking to israel and my blessings upon your offspring us and they shall spring up as among the grass so all of a sudden it's, it's gonna be a great awakening we have went into this famine with of no word of god and then we come out of this famine of no word of god and when i mean we come out of this famine really what I like to say, personally, my opinion, is the American captivity is the beginning of us coming out of this famine because the Gentile gave us our God back. And when I mean he gave us our God back, we left out of Africa Muslim. We didn't leave out of African Christian. We didn't leave out of African uh, uh, Africa observing the Sabbath day. So it took us to come into captivity in order for us to be able to uh, be forced to read our own book. The Gentile didn't write this book. They may have published it, but they didn't write it, but they had to give it to us. And basically this was, this was our learning. This was our reading. So he says, verse five, one shall say, I am the Lord's and another should call himself by the name of Jacob. And another should subscribe or write with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. So what he's telling you is, is going, basically it's going to be an awakening that takes place amongst Israel. And this is, this awakening is happening now. So going back to Acts chapter two, <clears throat> going back to Acts chapter two, verse 14. Well, I'm going to start at verse 16, but this is, but this is 
that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel should come to pass in the last day, saith the Lord God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, we read in Isaiah when he was talking about pouring his spirit upon his seed. Then he said, uh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. We know he's quoting this out of Joel. And guess what? Now, today, before it even the eclipse, right? But even before, like even a hundred years ago, like we begin to prophesy, we begin to await. Like Isaiah was telling us what's going to happen. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And then on all my servant and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So we're in that that time period. We're in now. We've we've come out of the dark ages, and we are now becoming enlightened. Then it says, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Now, what he's doing, Peter, and what Joel was doing covered a multitude of time not a day or a week or it's a multitude of time so we the lord is pouring out his spirit upon our flesh now if you want it so when we start talking about in the last days we're in those last days now and it should come to pass in the last days but at the end of the day we not at the day of the lord we'll catch that so let's go to uh matthew Matthew chapter 24, and then we're going to go to Revelation, and then we're going to open up the phone line, and we're going to check YouTube for questions or more comments. So in Matthew 24, this is how it reads, and we have to be careful with it. Uh, we're going to walk it. A lot of times we read through it fast uh, or grab a verse here or there. We're going to walk it through a little more carefully here. So I'm going to pick this up at verse 1, actually. And Jesus went out, Matthew 24, verse 1, and departed from the temple. And his disciple came to him for to show him the building of the temple. So the, this temple is the temple. The initial temple is Solomon's temple. Where we go, the children of Israel go into captivity by the Babylonians, and that temple is destroyed. We come out of captivity uh, under the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. And when we come out of captivity, we are... We now are able to rebuild a temple, never with the glory that the first temple had. The children of Israel was never going to match that. I mean, it was gold plated, ivory coated. I mean, it was just the bomb. It was, it was, it was all that and some. But we built another temple. Took a little time. You read the books of es, uh, uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and show you in the building of that temple. Hey, it was so rough. The people didn't want us around. We built in the temple with a sword in one hand and the, and, the, and, the, and the cement in another hand. Like, it's rough action. So we built this temple. And by the time Jesus comes on the scene, some 400 years later, then, hey, bang, they walking by, they see this temple. So Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him and to show him the building of the temple, buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be, be left here one stone upon another that should not be thrown down. So Jesus is telling them, like, hey, this temple is not going to be the, the end all. Like, this ain't the last one. Because you got to understand, Jesus the king. And the disciples are understanding this. They, he's the Christ. He was born of the seed of Jesse, and that's where the kings come from. So to show him the temple, you know, it's like, yeah, like, look, look what we got. And he like, nah, this ain't even it. This going to be destroyed. So verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, tell us, what shall these things be? So they want to know, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them. So we're going to answer all three questions. We're going to answer what's the sign of the Lord's coming. Uh, when is this temple going to be destroyed and the end of the world. All of that is going to be covered in this particular chapter. Just like we covered quite a few things in a few verses. Here we're going to cover the sign of the Lord's coming, the end of the world, and the destruction of the temple. So verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. 
and there should be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, all these things are happening, like earthquakes in diverse places, pestilence is taking place. He said all these things are the beginning of sorrow. So these are the more uh, important signs to be looking for if we're looking for a sign. We won't be looking for famines and pestilence and earthquakes in, in different places. Like how we had an earthquake over here in Pennsylvania a week ago. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then, so here's another thing you need to look for as we're talking about the return of the Lord. Then they should be deliver you up to be afflicted and should kill you and should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So now he's telling you, hey, you're going to be representing the true God of Israel and people are going to be ready to kill you. No, not ready to. People are going to kill you over that. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because of iniquity shall abide, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So again, when he's saying this gospel got to be preached, he's really bearing witness to an awakening. You got to remember, we already read in Amos chapter 8 that we have went into a famine. That means it was for a word of God. So the word of God was gone. So now he's saying, before we get to the coming of the Lord, we're going to have an awakening. He, again, he said, if this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye shall, oh, this got to happen for the end, though. When you should see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So now you got to look for this abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about. And this abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist or the, the, the head of the Catholic Church decides that he's going to declare himself as the replacement of God or as God, doesn't matter. And one of the things that he's going to do, according to the book of Daniel, he's going to cause the sacrifices that somebody's going to start up over there in Jerusalem. He's going to stop them. He's going to set up his kingdom and try to rule the earth from Jerusalem as king of the world or as the replacement for Jesus. Okay? That's what the abomination of desolation is. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that get suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So, before we get to this great tribulation, we have to have this abomination of desolation set up. Once he sets up, now we approach into what's, what's called the worst time ever, the great time of Jacob's trouble, another place calls it. It's uh, the great tribulation. So when you watch those movies like Left Behind and things of that nature, they're trying to emulate their idea of what the Great Tribulation is. But quite often they're wrong because they're placing it even within the seven years. They're wrong because they got the wrong Antichrist. I mean, they just be wrong, wrong, wrong. Cute, but wrong. So in verse 21, it says, For then shall there be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. So if people start saying, yo, the Christ is over there, or the Christ is in Jerusalem, or Christ is in Utah, or Christ is in Texas, or Christ is in Florida, or in Brazil, or wherever else they're trying to say. He like, no, nah, I don't believe, you know. For there, is, there shall arise false Christ. And false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. So what he's saying, there's gonna be people out here deceiving you, but the Lord gonna come back and he's gonna show you he's how he's coming back. So, and this is where we get to the sun turning dark. So again, going back to Acts chapter two, and we we we're gonna probably finish it there. But going back to Acts chapter two, it said, Hey. Uh, in, in the end days or in the last days, you know, young men going to start dreaming dreams and prophesying. And we read, hey, this is going to happen. And it's happening. 
We came out this famine based off of Amos chapter 11. It's no longer a famine in the land. The word of God is coming out. Like, 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 we, we look, it said you was going to look for it and not be able to find it. We didn't found it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this right now. We wouldn't be keeping Sabbath days. We wouldn't be eating clean meats and honoring the Lord's holy days if we were still in a famine like we were four or five hundred years ago even. So, anyway, it says, um, behold, I have told you before, verse 26, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he, as in Jesus, is in the desert, go not forth, behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east, so he said, just like you see lightning coming, shining even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So that means you're going to be able to see the Son of Man just like you see lightning. It's not going to be a mistake. They're asking in this particular chapter, when is the return of you, Lord? When are you coming back? And the end of the world. Then he says, for where so... Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of the heavens shall be shaken. And he shall, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, the sun and the moon turning dark is at the return of the Lord, not at an eclipse that happened in April of 2024. Nowhere else are when we're reading do we see that indication, sun being uh, uh, turning black, moon turning red. We don't see that indication anywhere till after the tribulation in reference to the Lord coming back. So what we saw the other day was just an eclipse. Just what it, what we saw the other day is no, no more complicated than the position from the earth to the moon to the sun. Now we know on a daily basis the earth, the sun be on, it starts in the east, ends in the west. We know on a daily basis that the moon be rising and setting too. Like we see it. It don't be in the same position all the time. So at some point, and we also know that the moon will be out during the day. So at some point in time, a few points in time, the sun is going to uh, be blocked by the moon. Meaning just like Clouds going to block the sun at some point. It's more clouds. The sun is bigger. That happens more often. Eclipse, one moon, one sun. We're talking about all these degrees in the earth, I mean, in the air, and we got to, bang, match them up at the perfect time. That's not going to happen every week. That's not going to happen every month. It's not even happening every year. Okay? Now, one other thing. Revelation, and then we'll go back to Acts, and then we'll open up the phone line. Uh, in the phone line, we'll check YouTube, all that. Um, where do I want to start? Um, I think it's what we want to start when he said, I, John, was on the island of Patmos. All right, all right, all right, all right, bang. So we're going to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 9. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. And it reads, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle or island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was on, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So, what we got going on right there is, this book of Revelations is going to cover the Lord's Day. And when you read it, and I can pretty much break it down to you chapter by chapter, 
uh, chapter 2 and 3 are the introductions to the seven churches, meaning each one of these churches is going to get the rest of the book of Revelation. Meaning, I'm not going to send the church of Sardis the Philadelphia intro. I don't need to do that. So it's seven letters going out. And then it starts, verse chapter 4. Uh, after this, I look. So the first thing John wrote is he, he was on the Isle of Patmos, but he said the first thing he wrote is what he started seeing. I look, and he saw the you know the throne of God and, and, and that type of thing. Then once you get chapter 5 and 4 go together, then once you get to chapter 6, he start discussing in chapter 6 the Antichrist, and he starts talking about the return of Christ. This is the Lord's day. And everything in this book is about the Antichrist or the return of Christ. And it's all about the end time after the Great Tribulation period. That's the Lord's day. Anytime after that, we could say, anytime after that, he said he was in the Lord's day. I mean, somebody might want to specifically be like, oh, it's the day that the Lord come back. I'm like, yeah, but when we read, he just said that he was in the Lord's day. And then he covers all of the prophecies that happened really from the Antichrist and the tribulation on forward. So anyway, going back to Acts chapter two, and then we're going to open up the line again. So I'm going to go back to Acts chapter two to the repeat of the question. And then hopefully my brother who had the question, I, I don't, he's probably not watching, he's probably, he's probably working. But uh, hopefully, oh my, we got a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully, yeah, and I'm long-winded. Or So anyway, hopefully he can get some understanding on So we're going to go back to uh, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 16. And he says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it should come to pass in the last days. We saw last days are relative. And it says, um, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. These things are happening now. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. That's what we do. And I will show wonders in heaven above. So he's telling you, I'm going to show you some wonders in heaven, signs on the earth, uh, beneath blood and fire, vapor and smoke. And we can see even more of that in Revelation. The sun shall be turned into darkness. So, again, this we saw that the sun was turned to darkness when we was in Matthew 24. This was after the Great Tribulation. So, the events that we saw as an eclipse is not after the Great Tribulation. Therefore, this the, that has the there is no there is no place in the Bible for an eclipse. It's just not. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't. It's 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 like having a place in the Bible where the clouds cover the sun. Like it's just not a necessity. To put that in there. So hopefully that helps clear that up a little bit. And we are going to go. I'm going to go to the phone line first. And then I um, I see some good questions here. We'll be able to do that. I'm going to go to the phone line first. And then I'll um, come get start dealing with some of these questions that we see here on online. So do um, we have any questions on the phone, phone line? I mean, the, I did see it, but the only thing I saw was the magnificence of the Lord. That's, that's, that's what I saw out of it. Because that was a magnificent sight. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Like, it really was. And you know what makes it so magnificent? The rarity of it. We don't get to, how often do we see that? You know? Like, that's what, because, like, all, like, God is evident everywhere. You know what I mean? Like just look, just just like when I'm I'm riding down the street and I'm seeing like it's the month of a bib or the beginning of the year, but I can bear witness to it because I'm seeing things growing back. See, that's that's the magnificence of the Lord, even to me. You know, like so it's but definitely what you're saying. I'm in a hundred percent agreement with what you're saying. I'm just saying, shoot, it's just the rarity of it that really blows our mind. Cause what if it happened once a month? It'd just be once a month, uh, we, but it can't. Like, that's not how to, like, that's, I like to say, not how the stars line up. <laughs> no, and, and the, the, uh, magnificent, real magnificent part was you could see just how bright the sun is when the moon went right in front of it. I mean, you could see that brightness all around. Oh my gosh. This is why they tell you that you can't really look at it. 
when right before it get uh, to, uh, totally dark, you can't um, you can't really look at it because it'll, it'll do, um, mess up your eyes. And I could see what, what they mean once the moon got right directly in line with the sun. I said, I see how bright the sun really is. Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's, just, it's just so magnificent. Did you have those glasses? Since we were in, huh? Did you have those glasses? No, oh. I, uh, actually, I was on my balcony and I could see it. Okay. I seen it getting dark. I said, ooh. I said, it's happening now. So I went outside, and by the time I got out there, the, the moon was directly already in front of the sun, so I, I was able to see it without. Where, without where are you located? And I was just going to tell you, I'm in, I'm in Dallas, so okay. we got a chance to see it, the, the, the total thing. I mean, they were fretting at first because they were thinking, because it was, it was really cloudy here, and they were thinking, oh, man. We may not get a chance to see it, but the clouds, I mean, that's what I was saying, how magnificent the Lord is. He moves those clouds out the way so we could actually see his magnificence. I mean, look at the Lord work. Yeah, that's because amazing. It was, it was really, it was really, it was really cloudy here. And then all of a sudden, clouds went our way and the eclipse happened. And I mean, it, it was just, it was just really, really I'm, one, I'm not one of those that had to spend money to come here to actually see it, which made no sense to me. <laughs> but, um, uh, I mean, because most of the hotels and stuff were, from the last uh, news report I heard, were 95% at capacity. I said, all these people come here just to see. I mean, I can understand to a degree, but look how much money you're spending just to go see something this rare when some people may not have even really had that kind of money and just spending it. Yeah. It makes no sense. I, I know here in... in borderline worship too. I'm sorry? It's borderline worshiping uh, the sun and the moon. They go to them extremes. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you know, at the, the at the, you know, I say this. I mean, people pay a lot of money to go see a Super Bowl. So, I mean, you know, it's a concerts, you know what I mean? So it was a once probably in a lifetime event. And um, like here, it just it just got kind of dark, but it didn't, it got really dark, but not pitch black. Like I noticed in some places, like, and I guess I, I think I saw actually uh, Dallas cause they, you know, the news coverage and um, where it got like pitch black, like it got pitch black in the middle of the day, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see it didn't get, it got dark here. You could tell too because um, normally it gets kind of dark right before, uh, it, it, especially if, like here it's been raining a lot. Um, right before it start, the clouds start coming in for it to start really just pouring down rain like that. It gets dark like that, but this was a totally different dark, and you could tell the difference too. Mm -hmm. like, oh, this, this, this is it. I mean, and by the time I got to my balcony, the moon was already in front of us. I said, look at this, it's so I mean, it really, really was something to see. Oh, yeah. And if you were able, I mean, the only thing you can really see out of it as far as taking pictures or anything like that is what NASA has, uh, unless you have one of those type of telescopes that can take pictures and stuff. But it was really, it was just so magnificent. I said, look at the Lord's work. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm listening. No, I'll finish. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna I'm take us to a scripture, just testifying to what you're saying, and it's Psalm 19, Psalm chapter 19, and it's like verse one and two. And um, That's my favorite, one of my I, favorite song. Absolutely, I can imagine when Jesus died, what you experienced. It took that. That was a three-hour experience for them. Like you, you experienced it for a, for a brief moment. I don't know, maybe two minutes, maybe a minute, maybe not even that long. Man, it was dark for three hours when Jesus died. Can you imagine? And then the sun came back out. And you know, in the Bible, we see that the Lord held the sun still with Gideon. So I wouldn't be surprised if what the Lord did on that day, 
but just made it all line up and kept it there. Now, I, don't, I wasn't there. I know it was dark. I'm not saying it was an eclipse, but I can imagine that it probably was something of that nature. But um, Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, he says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night show of knowledge. So, like, that's a to me a fitting scripture to what you're saying. Like it showed the 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 wonderful work of God, and it's like, yeah, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show of His handiwork, and it really did. Mm -hmm. yeah. It really did. And I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you just one more thing. Uh huh. They they were interviewing different people. I heard only one person, one person, say say how uh how magnificent God is. Those everybody else were talking about in the in the realm of science itself. Uh huh. Or how how magnificent it was they were talking to the little kids and stuff like that. Of course, you know the the parents were there too, and they were talking to they interviewed them too, but. Like I said, I only heard one person, mm. one person mm. say the magnificence of, of God. And I said, um, yeah, I'll I tell you where we are as a society. God is not in our thoughts. I'll be watching some of those videos and they be asking people, can you give me three Bible verses out the Bible? Or do you do you believe in Jesus? And people be like, no. I'm like, what is wrong with y'all? But uh, yeah, that's where we are, man. We at these end times where people don't want to hear the truth. They'd rather hear a lie. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and get to some of these questions on uh, the phone line. I mean, not on the phone line, uh, on our uh, live chat. Uh, I see yours, Kyle. We'll get to yours later just because yours probably going to take a little more uh, than some of these others I'm seeing. So the first one we're going to hit is that wants to know what the Passover is and what does it mean, like everything about it, who, what, when, and why. He is tuned in. Oh, you're saying he's watching now. Okay. Uh, yeah, still, we're going we're gonna to do, we're going to try to knock out some of these other ones real quick, and then we'll get back to it. So it says, can you please break down 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 29, what constitutes drinking of the cup of the Lord unworthily? All right, let's go see what verse he's talking about. 2 Corinthians, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is where our next question is coming from. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27 through 27 through 29. Uh, so we're going to read that first. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 27 through 29. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. All right, so what, is we, what are we even talking about? He's talking about the Passover. If we go up a little higher to verse uh, 23. It reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do a remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So, this is, a lot of people call it the Last Supper, but it wasn't a Last Supper, it was a Passover. Then he said in verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That's key. Then he says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. Let every man examine himself. So let's let's do first thing we're going to do real quick is go back to Matthew and see when they did this, what was said. Let's go to Matthew 26, I think. And then we're going to go to, uh, where did my brain just take? Oh, we're going to go to Hebrews. Matthew 26. And let's 
pick it up at verse 1, and we'll jump through it a little bit. And we're answering, I think it was Joel. Uh, yeah, we're answering, no, I'm sorry, Joseph Allen. Can you please break down 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 27 through 29? What constitutes drinking of the cup of the Lord on work? Really, at the end of the day, well, we're going we're gonna to let the Bible speak. So Matthew 26, the first thing we're going to do is just find out when that was. So I'm going to pick it up in verse, uh, uh, 17. So it said, now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, what wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, go into a city to such a man and say unto him, the master said, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at the house which the, with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover. Now when evening was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in this dish, the same shall betray me. So like you got to kind of pay that part some attention too when you're talking about taking unworthily, because he's doing that. that the, the, uh, Judas is actually doing that right here. Then he says, Verse 24, the Son of Man goeth as it is uh, written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed, then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said it. He was like, Man, it was me. He was like, Man, you already know. And they were, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. But this is my blood of the New Testament, which I share for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's deep. So, going back to the first Corinthian, and we just quoted, he Corinthians quoted Matthew. This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do you as often as you drink it. Not often. Not do it often. As often. You do it once a year. You do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So every year you repeat, you're showing the Lord died for your sins. For the remissions of your sins. That's what he said. Then he says, Wherefore, whosoever should eat of the bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, me, I'm going to be honest with you. I take this time. Uh, a lot of people do it at the atonement. I take the Passover and the atonement to, hey, examine yourself. And if you ain't right with God, because he said don't take it unworthily, then you need to be doing some heavy repenting. And don't find yourself on the page of Judas. Judas took it unworthily. We saw what happened with him. He ended up killing himself. He ended up, and when we say that, like, you reprobate, bro. So you, you don't want to put yourself in a position that you're uh, uh, playing with God. Now, going to Hebrews chapter 10. And we're just going to go right into verse 26. He says, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now remember, every time you take that blood, I mean that uh, wine and bread, is representing your sacrifice for sin. He said, but if you sin willfully, then there is no sacrifice for your sins. That's you sitting there. If you sin willfully, you ain't got no business taking this pass off. Like if you just do on you, don't even show up. Get yourself together. Now, the room gonna be filled of people that's working out their own salvation. But if you just gonna sin, if you just out here, he said, but a certain fearful, this is what you got. But a certain if you're gonna be doing stuff like that, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment. So, like he said, you taking this Passover, then be prepared for judgment. Righteous or ill unrighteous. And if you unrighteous and fiery indignation, which is a devourer of the adversary, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose you should he be th thought worthy who have trod another foot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done 
despite the spirit of grace. So when you operating despite the spirit of grace, then you taking this cup unworthily. When you operating out like if you out here wild, man, like you ain't getting yourself together. We ain't talking about you praying to the Lord to help you get over your issues and you know you you went from drinking, you know, uh, uh, a cup of hour to a cup of month. You know what I'm saying? But you're still drinking too much. Like, I'm just using that as an example. Like, we're not talking about people that's improving upon themselves. We're talking about people who just, you don't care no more. You're just doing you. All right? Um, let's keep it in Hebrews, I think. Uh, no, we ain't got to read this. We ain't got, so, really, when you ask the question, what is it taking it unworthily? The best thing I can tell you is when you out here and you wilding, you, you sinning willfully. I'm going to use what the book say. You sinning willfully, don't take it. You know, what Judas was about to do, that was willful. Like, you you sitting there with them, oh, yeah, is it me, Lord? Like, dude, you know what you about to do. You know you about to walk out of here. He was like, don't do what you got to do. He left out of there, came back a few hours later, bang, did what you had to do. It's the same thought process. Like, it's about as long as we have in Bible studies, about as long as it took for Judas to go and come back. You know what I mean? For him to do the same, you know, for him to betray him. So that's a good example of somebody taking the unworthy. So at the end of the day, if you're going to be out here sinning, leave it alone. It's not good for your health, literally. So hopefully that helped clear that up. And if it doesn't, just let me know. We can get to some more detail. I still see your question. We'll get to it uh, about what exactly is the Passover. Uh... Peace. May you please explain Revelations chapter 2, 19 through 24. Does this mean that those mingling idolatry and false worship will go into great tribulation and not be not be able to flee as in verse 22? Okay, gotcha. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, and... Is this addressed to us who are in the truth? Thank you. Okay, very. that's the same question. Okay, so here, here's the thing. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 1. Back to Revelation. We read this today. I'm going to read it one more time. And we are going to go to Revelation chapter 1. And where are we going? Let me see if I cut this volume down so I can get this to stream. Uh, there we go. Okay. Let me see. So, uh -uh. back to Acts chapter 2 to the repeat of the No, okay. All right, sorry, y'all. Don't want to lose no questions. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 1, and we go back to Revelation chapter 1 again. I'm going to pick it back up. Uh, Where were we before? Oh, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and in patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, heard and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in the book and send it to the seven churches. So just remember, these are all letters going to the seven churches. So, chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he that holds the seven stars in the right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So, this is to the first church. Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, how thou cannot be, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and has borne and has patience uh, for my name's sake, and has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. So he's talking to this church. He said, like, I got an issue with you. He was like, because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen and repent. So he's get, he's sending out this letter saying, hey, you need to remember how, what you fell from or repent. Now, look, he is literally talking to the church in Ephesus. Literally. Um, those particular people. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to take credit from, from it. Brother, shoot, who taught this lesson first? A letter to the seven churches. Maybe Andrew. Or maybe Naphtali, rest in peace. Or I think it was one of them two. They did a lesson called uh, A Message to the Seven Churches or something like that. And I read a long time ago. And I, now I teach it. Um, and in that lesson, what I show you is these churches, these seven churches, they're gone, past. 
But the message to them is to us now, still, still relevant to us now. But the the letter itself, the, the, the letter itself is still just is to them. For example, verse five, he's still talking to the church of Ephesus. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. Do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick. Well, that, that applied to anybody. But he was talking to the church in Ephesus. Now, um, she would have, oh, 19. Okay, so verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things said the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy work and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things uh, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. So up in Smyrna, hey, they was going to prison. Now, he might cast some of us in prison. But up in Smyrna, they was going to prison. And then it said that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. So he was like, hold it down, and you're going to get your salvation. That's what he told him, period. Be faithful unto death, you're going to get your salvation. That's the message to Smyrna. And the message he had to Pergamos. Now, let's see. That's not where you're, but he had a message to Pergamos, 12 through 17. So now we're going to get to your question. We're going to read the question again, and then we're going to go to the church. So it says, uh, peace, may you please explain Revelation chapter 2, verse 19 through 24. Does this mean that those mingling with idolatry and false worship will go into the great tribulation and not be able to flee as in verse 22? No, it doesn't mean that. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that none of these people making it to great tribulation. The people he's actually talking to, they're all dead. You know what I mean? So they couldn't possibly make it through, make it to great tribulation that we're referring to from Matthew 24. Now, let's look at, but again, seven churches, it's messages to each particular church, but it still can apply the message to us in this day. So let's read their message. And then to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things said the Son of God, who have eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and thy last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophet, is to teach, and to seduce my servants to commit fornications, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So, you got... <laughs> this false first of all women ain't even supposed to be the preach, priest but you got this false priest woman he called her a Jezebel she up there lying this was the topic here for them I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not now I don't know if he talking spiritual or physical it don't even matter I think he was talking uh, physical but it could be spiritual too either way is wrong behold when I say that I'm saying seduce my people and servants to commit fornication into things that well, could be spiritual. But regardless, he said, I gave her opportunity to repent of her fornication, and she ain't repent. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So, he's talking to them then, and they're going to go into a great tribulation. Not our great tribulation, a great tri a tribulation. Period. He's just calling it great because it's going to be tedious on them. The people in Smyrna was going through a tribulation. Oh, remember? Some of them going to get cast into jail for 10 days. Once Jesus died, look, from the time, mm -mm, not even that, for about a 10 year span, about 15, 10 year span, coming up to 70 AD, there was a great persecution of churches. These churches aren't that he's writing these letters to, they're in Asia. Not Asia like um, the continent Asia, but they're, they're not in Jerusalem. Best way to look at it. So they're about to be experiencing this tribulation that all the people in Jerusalem is experiencing. Like, if you notice, Paul was killing people for being Christian before he saw Paul, before he converted to Paul. He was, saw, he was killing people. So this was not an uncommon thing. So all it's simply telling you is to them particularly, hey, if you don't do it, he said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed. Talking about that Jezebel. And them that commit adultery with her until great tribulation. So it's probably spiritual. Then he says, Except they repent of their deeds. And then, I mean, it says, uh, 
I must have skipped something. To do so, to commit fornication, to eat the things, sacrifice the idols. And I gave her space to repent. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So, notice too, he said, and all the other churches going to know about you, about this church of uh, thi uh, thi Thyatira. So, what? know what about them? That they was dealing with whatever God Jezebel had them dealing with, and God sent them uh, 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 through a tribulation for it, killed their children for it. Like, that's that. So, it's not that, it's not that major, out the, like, it's not, no, it's just as simple as it reads. That's all. Then I'm going to finish it. He said, uh, I will kill, verse 23, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches should know that I am he which searches the rent and, and heart, and I will give unto every one of you according to your words. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not the doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak. So yeah, he talking spiritual fornication. I will put upon you none of the burden, but that Ye have already hold fast till I come. So obviously, they was going through stuff, and he was like, just hang in there until I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, he will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of a potter, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So hopefully... Uh, brother, who asked that question? No, sister, destiny. Yes, hopefully that helped you and some understanding. All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, peace, brother Addison, Israel, Ira. Uh, peace, sister Elizabeth. What's up, young Ben? Uh, Ben Brooks, peace. All right, here we go. Uh, don't worry, Sister Kai. We're gonna get to yours. It's just I, I don't I don't want to rush through it. Peace, brothers. What does the seal mean in Revelation chapter seven, three through eight? That's a good one. So, um, how are we gonna do this? I guess we probably gonna start at six and then walk into seven, and then we'll be able to see the seal. We ain't gonna have to go too many more places. So, Revelation chapter six, and I want to pick it up at verse one. And I saw when the Lamb opened of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and as a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So it's talking about a king. This is the Antichrist is talking about. So Jesus opening up the seals, the first one, he's introducing the Antichrist, and he's going to introduce his works. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And they went out another horse, I mean, and there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him. They sat there on to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So the king is going to be killing. Verse five. And when they had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see, third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat upon him, sat on him, had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the so again, now you're going to see that this Antichrist is going to have, or this, this king who's the Antichrist, he's going to uh, take peace from the earth, and he's going to have control of the money. Verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I look, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. So now we see that this Antichrist is going to kill the fourth part of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, now this ain't the Antichrist. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. So the Lord opened the seal. John saw. He was looking like, yo, y'all got killed. Uh, for the word of God and for the testimony that they held. And they cried with a loud voice. This is a vision. So that's why they can cry. He says, and that, because it's not real. It's a vision. So dead people don't cry. So, but this is a vision. So he saw the people that were slain or dead. 
And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, doest thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwelleth on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So, so the fifth seal was like, hey, the Lord going to avenge the death. Then we get to the sixth seal. And I beheld and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as sackcloth and hair, and moon became as blood. We talked about this earlier. This is the return of the Lord. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, and even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were removed out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and great men, and rich men, and chief captains, and mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his his wrath is come and who should be able to stand so that's what the seals was about right so then john still and after these things i saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth so he like john still looking he saw these seals but then he's like i saw four angels and he said um that the uh then he says uh holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. So now you got another angel who got a seal, like the blood of the Lamb at Passover. Like it, similar. And I'm addressing that as in, in addition, Sister Kai had a question too. So I'm, kind of like, I'm, I'm saying this is a part of it. And I saw another angel, verse 2, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So he's talking to the angels, and he's about to say this to them. They're going to hurt the earth. This is their job. Their job is to hurt the earth and the sea. Verse 3, saying, hurt not the earth. So he said, wait a minute. Neither the sea nor the tree till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So what this is, is when the Lord about to put his wrath upon earth, there are going to be people like in the wilderness sealed where the wrath of God, just like in the land of Goshen, they were sealed. The wrath of God, when it was pitch black in Egypt, it wasn't pitch black in Goshen. Uh, when the uh, locusts came through, they didn't come through Goshen. When the firstborn came through, excuse me, when the death angel came through to kill the firstborn, everybody who had that Passover blood on their door was covered by the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they were not uh, killed. Their firstborns, firstborns were not killed when the, when the Lord, because they were sealed. Here, we see when the Lord come back, he said, hey, I'm going to seal these people. Not like a mark or not, like nothing that, it's not like, you know, let's say it's me, right? It's not like it's going to literally say seal or Jesus or nothing across my head. It's for the angels to see. You don't even see them now. So you're definitely not going to see the mark that they're going to put upon you to say, we can't hurt you. But they're obedient. So they're going to do what they're told. Verse 3, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the tree, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. Then he proceeds further to verse 9. After this, so after he saw who was sealed, I beheld in law a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kingdoms, and people, and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm trees in their hands. Then we go down a little further, and... Because uh, they're going to ask, who is these? One of the, oh, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and where came they? Where, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So look, what we're getting at is, before the Lord start putting his wrath, because once we get into chapter 8, it's the trumpets, and it's the wrath of God. Before he does that, God is going to seal or protect the ones that he need to protect. Because God ain't doing the fighting. Just like God didn't walk through Egypt killing the firstborn. He's going to send an angel. 
and the angel gonna destroy everything in this sight unless God has significantly said don't do it. And that's what that seal is about. That God is gonna seal certain people so that they do not get hurt during the great tribulation that we read about in Matthew 24 as well uh, that's going to take place on this earth. So hopefully that helps you understand. Let me read the question again. Peace, will you explain Revelation 2? No, that's not it. Oh, peace, brother. What does the seal from Revelation 3, chapter 7, verse 3 through 8? All right, yeah, cool, cool, cool. All right. All right, so let's go. Before we go back to here, can we going to go to the phone line. Do we have any other questions or comments on our phone line? Got still there. I do. All right, you got one, brother John. That's you, brother John. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, all right. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna get you. Gonna get your question in. Hold on. Uh, okay. I'm just looking at some of these other questions to see so I can get a gauge of time in my brain. All right. So, go ahead. What's your question, brother John? I mean, yes, it was the work of God. I mean, <laughs> when I say that, I mean, it, what, what was it? Um, it was the moon. It was the moon sitting in front of the sun in comparison to wherever you lived. So, like, sister, uh, like, like, um, one of the sisters said, Sister Cheryl was like, she literally, they were literally able to see it there in pitch black. Whereas here, it didn't one hundred percent cover the sun, so it got dark here. Like, like, and it was your it showed global positioning on the Earth to to the sun and the moon. But the eclipse was just that. It was just a uh, it's it's a it's an event that happens every so often in time. Like Halley's comet happens every so often, or um, or or more commonly, um, the moon is new once a month. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, every 28, 29, excuse me, every 29 or 30 days, the new, the moon is new. Uh, and when I'm saying that, I mean, I'm, I'm literally trying to get us to see that an eclipse is, it's, it's just, it's definitely an act of God. It's, it's beautiful, amazing, like no, no discredit to anybody that was amazed or really understood God by it. But at the end of the day, it's just, it's just, it's, it's not. It's nothing biblical. Like, it's nothing biblical to... And, and, and I'm going to read the scripture we read a little earlier again today. I'm going to read it again. But it's nothing biblical. It's not like we're looking at the eclipse and like, okay, where is that place in the Bible? It places in the Bible the same place as the sunset. Um, <clears throat> let's go to uh, Revelation. I mean, back to Psalm 19 real quick. We're going to read that again. We're going to read Psalm 19. And uh, we're not even going to, you know, because we did kind of talk about it a little earlier. But uh, so we're not going to, you know, get get too, too deep into it. But uh, I do want to share this scripture with you again. Because I don't like, uh, like, I don't, like, hey, it only happens every so often. I think they're saying that next time that's going to happen is, I don't think we're going to be alive or something. I, I don't remember what they, when they said it's going to happen again. I, I listened to it, but I just forgot. But um, at the end of the day, though. It's nothing more than this. Verse Psalm 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Like, it's literally that. It's, it's the Lord just showing you his handiwork. You know what I'm saying? His, um, it says, there is no speech nor knowledge where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And them have he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. He said, that's what the sun do. It's, he got a course for it. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So like that's, that's what the sun do. The sun start, it got a circuit that it covers. And all that happened was the moon happened to hit the circuit they intersected at the same time and that's what the eclipse was it was nothing more than that so it's nothing biblical it's nothing like me when i say it's nothing biblical it is no biblical event 
Like not the the pandemic was more of a biblical event than the eclipse, just to be honest. So hopefully, brother John, that helped yeah. a little bit. But like we, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, cause, cause they, my sister's name was telling me that uh, that different one was telling me they saw airplanes up in the skies, up shooting out stuff in the clouds, and um. Uh, and uh, they were they was they were flying over people's houses, helicopters, and planes and stuff, and uh, different parts of the, the city. And you know, and um, I thought maybe you know uh, what was that? You know, having to say that. Nah, you know, you know they said. Uh, uh, I think I heard brother Elijah mention this. They said, and when Y two K hit, when the year two thousand hit, that was gonna be it, and you know things was gonna change. Man, they should have said when the World Trade Center was going to get hit. That caused more change than 2000. You know, like, it, it, it's man be, man don't know. So, like the Lord say, I'm going to come back on man like a thief in the night. Because man don't know any phenomena that take place, anything that happened. Oh, the Lord coming back. That's what we was reading before. But we read the signs of the coming of the Lord. And the one thing we did not see in those signs who was an eclipse so i mean at the end of the day i don't know who airplane was flying where when and how i'm not denying or doubting that nobody did nothing weird or the government didn't try somewhere i don't know but i do know this much that the eclipse is just it's science you know what i'm saying that's what it is and science does exist and i'm gonna show you what i mean by that let's go to daniel chapter one real quick you know science exists like it's not Science, now, you know, you believe in science of a guy, we got some issue. But science is not, doesn't have to be an evil. Science is a fact of the matter. You know, so like what goes up must come down, that's science. So science is a fact of the matter. And when we look at Daniel chapter 1, and we look at verse 3 and 4, it says, Daniel 1, verse 3 and 4, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the promise, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace and of whom they might teach the learning uh, and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And they talking about Hebrews, and we talking about this time period probably was about 600, 700, 500, eight, about 700, 600 A.D. And we was, I mean, excuse me, B.C., before Christ. So we talking about 26, 2,600 years ago, and we was dealing with science then. Science has been in existence for a very long time. Again, science is not narrow. Science is broad. Engineering is science. You know what I mean? Uh, like sciences, and when I say engineering and science, like how you build stuff, how you create a clock, that's science. So it's not, you know, it's not just theories of evolution is science either. But the point is, we, man, uh, uh, you know, has, I'm, again, the point is, the eclipse is just a science, like it's just something that happens in life. It's the sun moves one way, the moon moves another way. It's a lot of degrees they cover in the sky. At some point, they intersect. It's actually as so, there's a there's an opposite. There's more than just that effect. That's what I'm, there's more than just that that can happen, you know. But anyway, hopefully that kind of helped uh, clear that up. And we're gonna go back to our questions on um on YouTube. I mean, yeah, back on YouTube. And we got just a couple more. So let's go to good evening. Where in the Bible was Genesis 48 and 22 fulfilled at? All right. Let's go see. Genesis chapter 48. And that's this is from who is this? Uh why can't I? Oh, Kayla Saw. Like South without the U. Uh Genesis 48 and 22. Genesis chapter 48. In verse 22. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. For thou have given to thee one portion above thy brother, which I took out of the hand of the Amorites. Oh, okay, good question. All right. So, 
Here's what's happening. Um, Joseph, jo, the chip, we're back in the days of Jacob and the 12 sons of Israel, Joseph, uh, uh, Judah, Issachar, Simeon, Reuben, Gad, Dan, Levi, Naphtali, all these, right? Zebulon. So these are Judah. So these are the 12 sons of Israel and Jacob is the father and he's about to bless all the sons. So Jacob doesn't bless Joseph. Instead of blessing Joseph, because Joseph don't need no blessing from Jacob. Like, if anything, Joseph blessing all them. Because he just saved the whole family. So ideally, it makes sense to say, hey, I'm not going to bless you, Joseph. Thanks for bringing us here, saving us. I'm going to bless your sons. So a lot of the blessings in, in, in Genesis chapter 49 is uh showing you some of the land that the 12 tribes got the 12 tribes of israel like a lot in that blessings that's what you see you know and really that's what genesis 48 is saying so i'm gonna start at verse one we're gonna jump through it and hopefully we can answer it so it said and it came to pass after these things that one told joseph behold thy father is sick and he took with him two sons manasseh and ephraim and one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself, Israel is Jacob, and sat up upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simon, they are mine. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. So what he's saying is, he was like, just like uh, Reuben and Simon, Reuben and, and, and Simeon, who really, he got issue with them. That's why he brought their name up. So he said, just like they mine, your sons is mine. And not only that, but I'm going to get them. Basically what he tell, basically what the prophecy is, I'm going to get them more. I'm giving you more than I, than anybody else, right? Um, verse 7. As for me, when I came from uh, Padan, uh, Raquel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephratah. And I buried her there in the way of Ephratah in the same as Bethlehem. And Israel, Jacob, behold Joseph's son, and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel, Jacob, were dim for his age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them, and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath shown me also thy seed. Talking to Joseph, like, I thought you was dead, I ain't even know, now I see your kids. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, took both Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands right wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my father Abraham Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angels which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's, Head unto Manasseh's head, and Joseph said unto his father, Not so, I mean, and Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn, put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, I know it's my son, I know it. 
He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed. So the younger was what? Uh, Ephraim? Yeah. And if you notice, when you read in the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, and you start talking about the northern tribe, one of the names that they get called is Ephraim. Like, so this is a part of that prophecy. Like, Ephraim end up being, their land end up being the capital of the northern tribe. So, and his father, verse 19, <clears throat> refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them. Let me go check what his, uh, what's the name from? Verse 22. Okay. And he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God, make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. But God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorites with the sword and with my bow. Yo, plain and simple. Because he blessed Joseph twice. He blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's why he said, I'm giving you one portion over everybody else. Because when he get into the next chapter, Jacob get a blessing, Reuben get a blessing, Levi, Simeon, Judah. But don't nobody get, they two sons get a blessing. And that's all that meant. So hopefully we got some understanding that on, in Jesus' name. Um, let's go to... Uh, John chapter, oh, uh, can you share the source that talks about our ancestors leaving Africa practicing Islam? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I can help you with that a little bit. And then, really, you just got to do some homework. Uh, I got a couple of books that I've read. And maybe they might help. And I'm, a, I'm about to grab them so you can see them. And there we go. So here's a couple books you can check out. Um, but that's something that you, I mean, for example, and here's one good way. Uh, start with Timbuktu and Mali and what took place there. And find out the discovery of why they, why, how it got its riches and why was Timbuktu created. Timbuktu was created to be the Mecca, uh, Mecca as in like Medina Mecca the, from Islam, was the Mecca of the West African Sahara. Meaning, we're not crossing that Sahara. We are going to, because they have to go to Mecca every so often. And so Timbuktu is the, 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 the source of Western African civilization. So as you when you start this learning about that or you read a little bit about that and you'll see that they were Islamic. Uh, here's a couple of books. Um, uh, the Cap Captives as Commodity by Lisa A. Lindsay, The Transatlantic Slave Trade. You can mess with that one. And here's another one by Hugh Thomas, uh, the, the Slave Trade. So those are some books that you can kind of read to send you on your path. But the best way to identify with what religion we had is really you got to go and get the history of Africa. And we and we when and, and when we when I say we was Islamic, we was partially that like we, you know, that that's the religion that spread throughout northern Africa was Islam. Christianity actually came into uh, Christian. I, I got another one for you, too. Now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, and this is a pretty famous one here. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Uh, the destruction of black civilization. Great, uh, great issues of race from 4500 to 2000 AD. So these are some of the sources that you can use that can help you find out what religions we had coming out of uh, Africa. But the most important thing is for you to have to go and study the history of Africa. Uh, it's almost a common knowledge. We definitely didn't leave out of uh, Africa with Christianity. Um, we left with Islam, and really it's worse than that. It's, 
Islam times, whatever paganism we was dealing with before we was converted to Islam. But that's another thing too. You want to look at the um, uh, to understand that a little better. You want to look at the the uh, the spreading of Islam and the spreading of Christianity. So those are some of the things in Africa. So those are some of the things you want to look at in those missions that took place. Uh, the Crusades got a lot to do with that, you know. So hopefully, uh, you know, you can um, check that out, you know what I'm saying, and, and maybe that'll help your search. Uh, Hebrew Harvey, John, John 12 and 40, is that he at the beginning of the verse, Satan or Jesus, all right? And so after we do that one, then we'll get to our original question here. And, um, yeah, we'll go to the phone line, check that, and then we'll get to our first question about the Passover, and that'll be, that should be it for the night, I guess. So let's go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And John 12, and what he said, John 12 and 40? Cool, cool. All right. Uh, y'all all welcome, man. Peace, brother Terry. Y'all all welcome. I, I appreciate y'all for being here with me and, and us grinding. You know what I'm saying? Getting these couple of hours of uh, of studying in. Um, <clears throat> John 12 and 40. So it said, He that blindeth their eye and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These things said Isaiah. When he saw his glory and spake of him. So there, so again, we're going to pick it up a little higher. And then we're going to go back to Isaiah. So uh, your question comes from John 12 and 40. I'm going to start up like around 38. And he said, uh, no, I'm going to start at 36. He says, while ye have light, believe in the light. That ye might be children of the light. I'm sorry. Let me back up. So we're going to go to verse 34. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how says thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? So they, they quote him, Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have light, lest darkness come upon you. But he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. While ye have light, Jesus is that light. Believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. He's like, man, I've been doing all this, and you don't want to believe me? That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who have believed our report? And to whom have the arm of the Lord been revealed? So he's like, that Isaiah 53 and 1, that's getting fulfilled because, hey, they don't believe that report. And that ain't the only time that that's getting fulfilled. But that's, he said, yo, that's getting fulfilled. Verse 39, therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah saith again. He had blinded their eyes. So the question is, who is the he? Is the he Satan or is the he Jesus? And have hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, find out who the he is. Isaiah chapter 6, that's what he quoted. And um, make their eyes heavy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> And we're going to answer your question right here, bro. So Isaiah chapter 6, and let's pick it up at verse 8. He says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go with for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be waste without, hmm. That really didn't answer your question, I guess. I mean, it did, but it didn't. 
uh, he have blinded their eyes. So let's look at another place where the Lord blind their eyes. That might help. In the same book, Isaiah 28. Isaiah's, well, I kind of gave the answer. <laughs> I kind of gave you the answer, but uh, we're going we gonna, to um, let this answer, though, too. Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, verse 9. Stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out the poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. Have closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers he have covered. And the vision is become and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. Wherefore, the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudish men shall be hid. What would to, so really, the Lord is the he. Just so we know. Let's go back to it. Like, the Lord is doing this work. And, dang, did I just move my spot from there? But I'll read the other piece. I did. I did. I did. Uh, whom shall he know? No, wherefore? Also, okay, okay, okay. That's good. All right, so let's go back to it real quick. And read it. John chapter 12 and 40. Now, here's the funny thing about your question. But the he is God. Uh, the, the Lord is the he. Uh, he's quoting out of Isaiah. Satan ain't doing that. But uh, I get the question, though, because it says in another place, because the God of this world have blinded them or something to that effect. So that would sound, but that's, but that's, he's not quoting this Isaiah. Uh, again, which we read in Isaiah uh, 6. But he says, therefore, verse 39, therefore they could not believe because the, the Isaiah said again, he had blinded their eyes and hardened, and that he, the Lord did. Uh, but that's the funny thing about it. Like, how did the Lord do that? He used Satan. But the, he is the Lord. Right? That's that's the bottom line. Um, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Yeah. Saw his glory and spake of him, you know? So hopefully that kind of helped a little bit. Going back to Isaiah is probably what you would want to do best, uh, Brother Har, to understand that a little better. All right. So we're going to go to the phone line one more time, and then we're going to finish up with uh, Sister, Sister Kai's question. Uh, uh, we got any more questions or comments on the phone line? I'm sorry. I have a question. All right, all right. Uh, go ahead. I'm listening. What's your question again? What's your what is it again? I I I, I didn't follow you. I'm sorry. He was saying that uh, we not know just I know Hebrew Israelite. He said that we all all of us Gentiles. You know, he said so we trace our genealogy back. He said we all Gentiles. He said we he said everybody want to be a Hebrew Israelite. He said we're not a Hebrew Israelite. Oh, okay. Well. Here's one thing I'll say while I'm wearing this big old Hebrew shirt <laughs> is that uh, we are sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, we Israelites. Uh, Hebrew, Israelite is, Hebrew Israelite is more of a term 
of uh, that we have kind of adopted over the years to identify us, probably to separate us from Israel and the Israelis. Uh, the Bible says that Jonah was a Hebrew. Uh, Jonah, they asked Jonah, who is he? He was like, I'm a Hebrew. Um, and then Abraham is the first Hebrew mentioned in the Bible. It was like Abraham was a Hebrew. So those, that's what Hebrews are. Israelites are sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Gentiles are sons of Japheth. So when you say sons of Japheth, we're going all the way back to Noah. He had three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. So when Japheth, no, let's go with Ham. Ham and his sons ended up being the Egyptians and the Ham, uh, the uh, Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the African nations. So by color and of identity and color, they are from really black to fair, meaning fair complected. Like uh, Ethiopians aren't really a dark complexion; they're a lighter complexion. But they're still brown skin. Uh, then let's go to Genesis chapter 10. And we'll look at who the Gentile is real fast. So I'm at Genesis 10, 1 through 5. And it reads, Now these are the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Mode, I mean, uh, Media, Javan, and Tubal, uh, Meshesh, and Tyrus, the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riftha, and Togomar, the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, and Kittim, and Dodin. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their land, everyone after his time, after their family, in their nation. So look, the Gentiles are the sons of Japheth. And when you start looking up these countries, they're going to end up being Greek or, uh, I knew them all. Greek, basically, you're going to find out, oh, yeah, you're going to find out they're the white people. They're the progenitors, German, Greek, stuff like that. They are, they, they white people, Caucasians, as we call them. But not just that, though, Asians, too. Asians, too. So, the Gentile color range, let's do color range. They're the whitest people on the planet. And then they get as dark as the people of India. They pretty dark over there. So they not they don't get as dark as the Hamite. They don't get dark as the Shemites, but they get pretty dark over there. That's 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 the Gentile. Shem, and I'm just gonna give you three Shemitic nations: the so-called Jew, the Arabs, and black people. We Shemitic. And we, our color range sits in the middle. We are, when you look at our color range, we don't get as we don't get as pale or as white as the Gentile. Neither are we as black as Ham to its extreme, but we sit where we cover kind of in the middle. We in the middle of Ham and and Japheth. That's kind of easy way of kind of understanding. Now your Arab nations, sons of they they are they are Shemitic, and Shem was the other son here. Uh, and, and this is a pretty known fact. They sons of Ishmael, and then your so-called Jews, they from Esau, and the real Jew or the Hebrew Israelite, as you refer to, are the sons of Jacob. So let's go to Deuteronomy 28, and we're gonna find out how we quickly identify them as us. When somebody says that you are not a Hebrew Israelite, but you are someone that fits these uh, characteristics then that means that the person who's talking to you just don't know what they're talking about. So Deuteronomy 28, I'm going to start reading it at verse 1. I'm going to try to move kind of quick because y'all please mute y'all phones. Uh, verse 20, Deuteronomy 28 and 1. And it should come to pass, talking to the children of Israel, after they, this is during the days of Moses, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the words of the Lord God to observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and 
the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall be when thou goest out. So the Lord is saying, if you keep my commandments when I put you in this land, sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israelites, or like we call ourselves today, Hebrew Israelites, if you are, when they got to that promised land, they would have kept the commandments. It was a blessing that was coming upon them. Let's skip over to verse 15. But it should come to pass, if thou would not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments, his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in. So he was giving it to him, and he was giving it to him kind of like, just at first, like hoping that they would change. Upon each curse, maybe. Verse 25. Then he says, And the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, fully seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So, like, that's something you want to underline when you identify in Israel. There's only been one nation of people that was removed. Nation, not individual peoples, or you done grabbed a couple of. We got a whole nation of people that was removed to another part of the earth. Thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray thee. So, yeah. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emeralds and with scabs and itch whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind grope is in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt but throw off the wife Another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house. Thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Like these qualifications of this, of who we're reading about, is only fitting one group of people. Verse 36. The Lord shall bring thee in thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there thou shalt serve other gods wood and stone. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume thee. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm shall eat of them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine oil olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. Again, there is only one nation of people that this applies to. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall purpose thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder upon thy seed forever. Again, verse 46. And they should be upon thee for a sign, like a sign is to identify something. So they should be upon thee for your identification. I'm talking about these curses. And for a wonder and upon thy seed forever to this day. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness. And with gladness of heart, and with for abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put the yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. I'm going to skip down a little more. I'm not going to read everything in this chapter, but I'm going to skip down to like verse. Um, let's just jump to the end. 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all the people from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there shall thou serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall thou find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and felling of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night and shall have non-assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, with God, till it were evening. And in the evening thou shalt say, with God, it were morning. For the fear of thy heart 
wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thy eye, which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. Now, you know, we walked out of Egypt. He's talking about Egypt ain't some place. Egypt ain't just about a land. It's about your captivity. So we can read this, and the Lord shall bring thee into captivity again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there you should be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. So taking that Deuteronomy 28 and finding out who those, those people are, those are the Hebrew Israelites. And when you understand and when you read it clearly in more pages of the Bible, but you see that though the Hebrew Israelites or are, are children of Israel are people that have been in the captivities, the black race of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the black race of people in America, both north and south, that are uh, that are were brought here as slavery. Um, even in Africa, there are Buku Israelites in Africa uh, that's mingled in with Ham. We scattered throughout the whole world. We're in Europe, um, but we started in Jerusalem. We started in the Middle East, and we not there. You know. Like we 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 scattered we we placed it there. I'm sure you know we got we in Des Moines. You know what I'm saying we we in a spot over there, wherever it's called. But we not there. But uh, so that's a good way of showing and proving who the children of Israel is, brother John, by using Deuteronomy 28. And the children of Israel are the Hebrew Israelites, FYI. So and if you and they read, they say like Jew or Gentile. Like if you ain't no Jew, you a Gentile. He trying to say you a Edomite. He trying to say you a so called Jew. Or that you, he's trying to say they the Jew, therefore you can't be it. But he's inaccurate, or she. So, hopefully that helped clear it up a little bit, John. Deuteronomy 28 is your chapter that you want. Um, man, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he gotta pick up my daughter. She, 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 yeah, he gotta pick up my daughter from school, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I miss him. Mm, I, I, yeah, right. yeah. It's not the it's not the same without him. Mm -hmm. That's all right though. He doing his job. Yeah, he being a help to the family. Yeah. So we are going to. I'm sorry. Yeah, no doubt. I praise the Lord for it. So we're gonna get to our. I guess. Uh, make sure. Man, everybody welcome, Hussein. Thank you. So let's get to our original question for tonight. Uh, it is, what is, uh, what, this is the question for someone that wants to know what Passover is and what does it mean, like everything about it. <laughs> I don't know if I can tell you everything about it, but in short, I can tell you what it is. So let's go back to Exodus real quick. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. So we're going to read what the Passover is. The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their father, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year. You should take it out. You should take it from the sheep and from the goat. Come on. You probably could walk behind, but just go ahead. You can walk in front. It don't matter. Just don't step on the cord. You going to read for the last scripture, bro? All right. Thank you. So, verse 5. Your lamb, and we in Exodus 12. And he says, uh, he says, your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year. And you should take it out from the sheep, and from the goats, and you should keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel should kill it in the evening. Verse 7, Exodus 12 and 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Uh -huh. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Go ahead. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it, sod it at all with water, but roast with fire. All right, that's good, that's good. So let's jump over now 
to verse 21. So we're going to see it in full action. Go ahead. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Yeah. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel or lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door mm -hmm. and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. Mm -hmm. And you shall observe this thing for ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Uh -huh. And it shall come to pass. When ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. All right, let's skip over to verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne until the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon. Dang, go ahead. And all the firstborn of cattle. Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. All right, so long story short, the initial Passover was, hey, Pharaoh thought he was cold, would never let the children of Israel go. Finally, the last plague came, we're going to kill the firstborn, and the Lord went ham on Pharaoh and them. So when, since that happened, then they finally let them go. You know what I'm saying? Like, they finally let them go. Then that's when you get a, he had a change of heart, like an idiot, went after the children of Israel, washed up in the sea. Uh, Leviticus 23, real quick. So, notice um, how it was like, man, they overcame, I mean, they, you know, the blood of the lamb. Like, that's what, you know what I'm saying? Like, they had, they had to have the blood, like, the blood of the lamb is what saved them. And so, when you're looking at it, and today, what is it all about? Well, Jesus is a representation of that lamb. And his blood is the blood that's going to save you. And he's telling you, well, go ahead, pick up Leviticus 23 and 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. Mm -hmm. A holy convocation. Uh huh. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Uh huh. These are the feasts of the Lord. Go ahead. Even holy convocations. Right, right. Which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Mm -hmm. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at eve, or at even, is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made. All right, that's good. That's good. That's good. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, so the so now he, you know, when you start looking at the Lord's feast days, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in the class that that's what Jesus was doing. They was partaking in the Lord's Passover, like that's what they was doing. And it, uh, another key thing is that this whole is like you you need this this blood of the Lamb is what what. It's covering you. Here's what I mean. Let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Like, it's covering your sins. That's that's what, it, at the end of the day, like, that's what this is about. Getting your sins covered. So when that death angel come through, you know, or when the Lord is, is, is sending that, like, when the Lord come through the check, you don't get killed. That's the easy way to put it. 1 Peter chapter 1. And start reading at verse 15. Go ahead. But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Uh -huh. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work. Yeah. Work that, I mean, <clears throat> pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Right. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold uh -huh. from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Uh huh. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a land without blemish and without spot. Right. So he said like, look, for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold for your vain conversation received by traditions from the fathers, but you were, 
uh, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Then he says, as a of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now you remember we read, or you might wasn't here yet, but when we read it, it was saying, "Hey, a lamb without spot or blemish." Christ is that lamb without spot or blemish. Let's go to Revelation chapter twelve. No, Revelation thirteen first. Then we'll go to twelve. Revelation chapter thirteen. Pick it up, verse eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Right. So the, the Jesus is the Lamb, and the plan for your salvation was that we gonna kill Jesus, like God gonna kill him. Like that's a part of the plan of salvation. He gonna be the first one to do it. Like he gonna humble himself, take on the form of a servant. And then he's going to die for the sins of the world. Like I say, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that who shall believe was on him, all that good stuff. His blood is where, is where your salvation comes. Uh, your, his blood covers your sins, and your uh, and his resurrection is your resurrection. Like That's giving him having eternal life. It's giving you the opportunity to have eternal life. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse uh, uh, 11. Go ahead. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, uh -huh. and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives until their death. Now, we're not even going to talk about who overcame by the blood of the Lamb, but at the end of the day, this, this blood of the Lamb, the same blood they was putting on the doorpost, which really is a representation of Jesus, this is your salvation. Your salvation lies within that. That's that's the thing. that like like Because when you say, can you give a full breakdown, I try to give you the best I can in a a full breakdown, you don't have to watch a whole class. That's what I'll say. Because um, that's what that is. But at the end of the day, let's go to Corinthians. We read this a little earlier. Let's go to Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. At the end of the day, like, you taking that Passover is a representation of, because uh, the Passover is a representation of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like, that's what it is. And so the blood is covering you, which is um, where your salvation lies. Like if you ain't under the blood of Jesus, then who blood you under? Um, first, first Corinthians chapter 11 and pick it up a verse 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone take it before uh, other his own supper uh -huh. and one is hungry and another is drunken what have you not two houses to eat and to drink in or despise ye the church of god uh -huh. and shame them that have not what shall i say to you shall i praise you in this i praise you not for i have received of the lord that which also i delivered unto you that the lord jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread uh -huh. and when he had given thanks he break it and said Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Go ahead. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Go ahead. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death to the come. All right, that's good. Now, nah, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and let's pick it up at verse 22. Hebrews 9 and 22. Go ahead. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Uh-huh. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Right. So, like, the, the, the wire represents the blood of Jesus. This is where your sins is getting remitted from. Like, you, you your salvation lies in... The fact that we can remit your sins with his death and then the fact that he's resurrected so you can resurrect. So the bread represents the body and the 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 the, the blood is represented in the wine. But the initial Passover was literally the blood of the lamb without splot or blemish. So when the death angel came through, but let's go to Colossians real quick. I'm gonna show you that when God do stuff, he he has it has a it is leading you to the future. Colossians Chapter 
2, 15 through 17. When you get there, go ahead. And having spoiled uh, principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. Jesus spoiled the powers and principalities, making a show of them openly. Go ahead. Triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Right. Uh huh. But the body is of Christ. Right. So he's telling you like on our Sabbath days and feast days, stuff like that. They are a shadow of things to come on like Christmas and Easter. That if anything, they just represent the God of the past. They don't have any. They're gods of the past. They don't have anything to do with anything to come in the future. Even the new year, Janice, like still dead a dead god uh one more place isaiah 53 so at the end of the day like the lord commanded us way back when before we left egypt that blood that was on our dope post it saved us the lord passed over the, the the children of israel but really it was representing the blood of jesus and it saves us now because he's passing over our sins now um uh, Isaiah 53, verse 5. Go ahead. But he was wounded for our transgression. Yep. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yep. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Yep. And with his stripes we are healed. Right. So, like, we heal with his with him dying. Now we can now, with him dying and resurrected, now we can get eternal life. And the... Passover is a show of you being covered or remitted, your sins being remitted. Uh, that the Lord, so like it's like you remitting your sins and then get your house together. That's the 11 bread, like it goes right hand in hand. Like, like it's almost like at the baptism, you're getting your sins remitted, and then you gotta, hey, like get it together. So, hopefully, that helps a little bit. Like I said, I man, we got plenty of lessons out here on it. And when is Passover next week? We got the next. It's a week after next. Um, I think. What's today? Today's like the eleventh or twelfth. No. Nope. Oh, today's the tenth. Nope. Bro. Today's the second day of the first month. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> then it's like twelve days, thir about twelve or thirteen days away. Yeah, yeah, it's like a week. Yeah. It's all good, bro. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and call it call it a night. Uh. I'm going to go ahead and get ready to close out. Thank everybody for your questions, your comment, your participation. Hope you guys learned something. Um, and I'm sorry. Uh -oh. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and close it out. You ready, son? All right, go ahead and walk us through it. Our Father, which are in heaven. Our Father, which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be, Hello be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will, will be, be done, done in earth. earth. As it is in heaven. As it, it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day, us this our, day daily our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us and our debts. Debt. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. 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 In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, it was a pleasure this evening. Hope you guys learned something. And, yep, that's a wrap, y'all. Yeah, thanks, everybody.